brought to you by EP Wealth. This is The Rob Black Show. One of my wants is for you to have a better relationship with your financial advisor. I don't want you to be your own financial advisor unless you really, really think that's going to be me and nobody else. One of the reasons I got into this industry was to fight bad advice. It was to kind of, I saw too much of that. I, I saw what you see. Oh, it, the stock is a roller coaster. And then, you know, you start hearing people's advice and you're starting to put together their stories. And some people will resonate with you. One thing you don't want to do is get into a financial relationship with someone that is um, with best of intentions, uh, uninformed. I see too many people say, well, I'm going to give you a hundred thousand dollars. Just go do what you do. Or I'm gonna give you money to invest and, um, not tell you that I have a special needs child or not tell you that I don't like down markets. It's not just up to the person you make a relationship with to talk to you, but it's up to you to talk to them. I've said this story a couple of times, and I really like that when I first met CFP Chad Burton, he cared about his clients to the point that he was like doing research on me, like just to make sure that I wasn't giving advice that was bad. Go out and buy Sun Microsystem. It goes nothing but up, and it goes nothing but down. You really have to have a relationship with your person who's giving you financial advice. Now, Here's where it gets interesting. I don't think you need a financial advisor until you're 50. If you're doing things ultimately on a simple level, on a Warren Buffett level, keep costs cheap, invest in ETFs in your 401k, save 15 to 20% of your income. You can go with something as stupid as a S&P 500 fund, a Wilshire 3000, Wilshire 5000 fund. Um, who else for 5,000 fun? A uh, Russell 3,000 fun. That's the one I was throwing that. I have no problem. That's what you want to do to accumulate wealth. You don't need a financial advisor. But once you get a financial advisor, it's kind of up to you to get to know that person. So Chad not only fought for his clients, checking up the sources of investment knowledge, but <clears throat> he also would meet at their house. He would pick up a pizza and sit down with them at their favorite pizzeria. I was like, that's what you want. And I identified it and it was almost like in my head, I was pointing at it. When I hear someone upset at their financial advisor, I'm like, I think something went bad there. And what I mean by that is somewhere in the communication process, you got to talk to your financial advisor. I'm, you know, 53 years old. I'm, you know, two years from retirement. I'm 10 years from retirement. I never want to retire. Those are very different statements. I want your financial advisor to have a CFP credential, certified financial planner. Like I said, I think you can do it until you get wealthy. And then you don't want to make a mistake. I don't want to make a mistake because then it's a mistake is like $100,000 mistake. And that's a pricey mistake. So on occasion, someone will say, can I sue my financial advisor? And I get it. The market's down a lot. Mistakes were made. And you feel like your risk should have been managed better because you said, I was afraid of down markets. Did you say that? That's what I'm asking. It's... A hell of a question when you say, can I assume my financial advisor? Because something went really, really wrong. If they have a fiduciary responsibility towards you, yes, you can. So when you say a CFP is a certified financial planner and they have to be act as a fiduciary, that's where you can get into that. They have to look after your best interest. You would first need to prove that you entered into a fiduciary relationship. You would pledge to put your that the person pledges with your interest 
your best interest before theirs. So they're not selling you a lot of commissions or product that they don't know anything about. You want to sue a financial planner, you would have to show a direct link between her actions and your losses and show that those losses could have been foreseen. So it gets into a weird issue of mediators and other issues. A good advisor should understand your circumstances and recommend only suitable financial products for your age, your investment objections, your experience, your desired level of risk. Uh, Me and my spouse have two very different levels of risk. And our financial planner, Brad, has to take that into account. And it stinks because her performance drags down my performance. But it's okay. Um, It's really interesting because one of the tools that a financial planner could use to help you have protection from downside risk is a stop loss. That's when you say if XYZ fund, ETF, stock, whatever it is, falls 10% that you want out. One minute. What's interesting is what I found psychologically, and there's a lot of psychological behavior, financial behavior that people have ingrained. People don't even want a 10% loss. They want a 0% loss with a 100% gain. It's an interesting industry. You can find me online at Rob Black Show, Twitter, Rob Black Show, YouTube, Rob Black Show. I'm Rob Black, talking all things financial, money, investing, and more. I think the crux of that whole segment was talk to your financial planner. For more information about EP Wealth, visit robblack.com. That's robblack.com. Year to date, the NASDAQ's down 30.5%, the SP 500 down 21%, the Dow Jones Industrial Average down 14%. 10-year treasury sitting around, where is 10-year treasury? Rob, where is 10-year treasury? I'll tell you, 10-year treasury is at 4.2%. Bitcoin still holding underneath 20,000, which is kind of interesting in the sense that when you look at it technically, you would think, like, I kind of want to see it on the other side of that handle. I want to see it above 20, not below 20. It's just a skosh below. Apple sits at $147 a share, down 16% for the year. NASDAQ's down 30% for the year. Apple's down 16% for the year. U.S. stocks are coming off their best week since June. Yay. Feels kind of nice, right? But it's probably not safe to check your Robinhood account, your day trading account quite yet. Don't go back in the water. Individual investor portfolios tumbled 44% from the beginning of January through October 18. So what I'm getting at is the Nasdaq's down 30%. Apple's down 16%, but the individual investor down 44% telling you they're taking on more risk and they're taking their losses. S&P 500 down just 21%. The Dow Jones Industrial Average down 14%. 2022, bumper sticker, valuation matters. I think that's fair to say. But are you going to retire this year? Then time frame starts to matter. A lot of headlines about the elections. Let's prep for the midterms. Democrats are trying to hang on to the House and Senate. The House, Republicans need to pick up five seats on net to gain a majority. There's 31 races that are called toss-ups. The Senate is split 50-50 currently, so just one Republican gain on the net would allow them to flip the chamber. Nevada and Ohio are the two tightest races. And what you're seeing is when a majority gets in, spending gets kind of a little punch drunk. Do you want more government spending or do you want less government spending? On Wall Street, you tend to save less. <clears throat> historically, and I'm not making any political commentary here, historically, the, historically speaking, the party that does the least is gridlock. The, the, and that allows the market to do the most. Just throwing that down there for you. If you're trying to figure out how to vote, don't look to me for answers. Seriously, I'm not kidding. 
Um, the stock market today is going to be dealing with a big week of earnings. The stock market is dealing with an international event first, as China has reelected for a third five-year term, their leader, Xi Jinping. And the stock markets there did not like it. Asian stocks underperformed, worries that he will pursue tighter regulations and persistence of the zero COVID policy, undercut investor sentiment, along with some weaker than expected retail data expected for September. So I saw this morning, companies like Baidu, JDCom, Pinduoduo, I saw them go down 10% this morning. I'm like, what's going on? And it's China consolidating power again around their current president. It's that kind of simple because in the last couple of years, we've seen his policy go, <clears throat> you'd see the Amazon of China, Baidu, and other companies lose their CEOs. Like, where did the CEO go? Well, he got too rich that the Communist Party said, you know what? You need to go take a break. And that's what we know. That's what we know. So today there's kind of a follow through. Well, if he's done it in the past, probably we'll do it in the future. Um, this week we have a lot of earnings, a lot of potential market movers too. Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Alphabet, Meta Platforms. Meta Platforms is getting just slammed in the market press today. In large part, people want Meta to stop talking about the metaverse. Bank of America security cited concerns for the meta platform's future today, seeing that reels in the metaverse aren't really performing. And um, yeah, that's something that bothers me. Have you logged onto Facebook recently and you're, you're going through your feed and they're, they force feed you videos? And like, why do I want to see a guy on a motorcycle fall off? <clears throat> So Bank of America is calling on Mark Zuckerberg to go be Mark Zuckerberg and make apps and not worry about the metaverse. Make the experience better in the Facebook world, meta world. Bank of America is seriously calling into question the metaverse and the spend. And mixing in some negative commentary saying the price target's going to be $150 because they're just not keeping up with TikTok. And Snap has already shown us that declining content consumption, i.e. people are watching what we're putting in front of them. So Bank of America has concerns over long-term advertising spending pressures. He expects that the third quarter advertising spend will be in line with consensus. However, fourth quarter and 2023 expectations need to be lowered. So we get Meta this week. We get Apple this week. What will Apple tell us about the iPhone 14? What will they tell us about China? We get Microsoft this week. What will they tell us about corporate America? I do love this time of year. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. My voice is just crap today. I'm so sorry. It's... uh. Seasonal changes, I think. Beyond earnings, there's going to be some economic report at, uh, reports to look, take a look at. Consumer confidence is a big one on Tuesday. Then we get the new home sales report on Wednesday, which I don't think we're expecting a lot out of. We get the advanced third quarter GDP report on Thursday. Are we in a recession? Are we not in a recession? What's the gross domestic product spend up or down? No one's expecting it to be down. What else do we have this week? Oh, personal income on Friday. So Fridays are big economic days for wages and who has jobs and what, how much they're saving. Friday feels like the best economic day today for me. But then again, this year, it's going to be about consumer inflation, not jobs, because we know the jobs are good. We'd be really surprised if the jobs were bad. Beyond Meat is rolling out a steak substitute in the grocery stores. Interesting times, is it not? It's called Beyond Steak. I don't know. It looks like it could be good at a burrito or something. I don't know if you want it as a steak, though. 
We'll talk about that and much, much more. I'm Rob Black, talking all things financial. Big event coming up November 17th in Palo Alto. It's the first live event in over two years. Very excited for that. You can sign up for the event at Rob Black Show, Twitter, Rob Black Show, YouTube, Rob Black Show. I'm Rob Black. Visit the Rob Black Show online at robblackshow.com. Listen to archived podcasts, market updates, and information from EP Wealth's certified financial planners online at robblackshow.com. It's so Beyond Meat is rolling out a steak substitute in grocery stores. It reminds me of Clara Peller in the Wendy's commercial. Where's the beef? It's coming to Kroger, Walmart, and other grocery stores. Remember, though, Beyond Meat's had an interestingly bad year. They've slashed 19% of their workforce. Beyond and Taco Bell started testing meatless carne asada using Beyond Steak at restaurants in Dayton, Ohio. So will this be their product that catches on? Feel that's really salty and price per protein? In my head, it's tough to justify. I get. I know there's a lot more going on socially and health wise that we can talk about here, but the price point doesn't seem to be enticing enough for people to go, yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> I am in. Black Magic at the box office, Dwayne the Rock Johnson. Pulled in $67 million. That's the best opening weekend since July. They're really, if you take a look at the movie slate this year, it's been very uninspiring. Now, again, we get it. There was a thing called COVID. But we're also getting very similar movies that have massive drop-offs after their first week. Superhero movies tend to have the largest drop-offs in the second weekend. So if Black Adam's going to recoup a reported $200 million budget, they got a long way to go if there's going to be a 50% drop-off after the $67 million. And then November 11, the one we've all been waiting for, Black Panther 2. Okay, maybe we're not all waiting for that, but <clears throat> the previews do give me goosebumps. And I didn't even see the first one, but I know the guy died. Now, let's stay with media for a little bit longer. F1, Premier League for open wheel, single seater cars. It's gone from zero to 223 miles per hour in the past two years. Now it's going into higher gear. I don't know a lot about F1. I don't know if there is an investment story here that's obvious, like, oh, this is a company that makes turbines. Or this is the media side. No, see, the media side is ESPN. And that gets into streaming. And it's interesting because Apple's trying to get the rights for the football package on the NFL. One of the things that's holding them back is that the NFL wants to sell the package on a domestic level. And Apple's like, but we're in an international company. Same thing's kind of going on with F1. It's more about the streaming than about the local rights. The International Racing Series finalized a deal with ESPN to extend broadcasting rights until 2025. The deal marks the latest game of tug of war between streamers and traditional broadcasters. It's one of the last bastions of strength at cable television. And Disney, interestingly, is straddling both sides of that fence. If you have Comcast cable at your home, you probably have an ESPN channel given to you automatically. There's no way around it. Even if you're allergic to sports, even if you're if yeah, sports triggers trauma in your head, you probably have access. And that means part of your cable bills probably go into ESPN. And when I say probably, it definitely is. So what is how do we value ESPN now? Are they is this a streaming win for them or is this a broadcast win for them? Because to be quite honest with you, the broadcast business of Fox, ABC, and CBS is something that I don't want to invest in. After inking a $1 billion season agreement, Amazon is getting mixed results. 
the NFL's Thursday night football games have been snoozers. Like, battle of field goals. They've been really, really bad. But Amazon's happy to have the NFL. They're going to broadcast the first Black Friday game, Amazon is. And you are going to see some crazy commercials for buying Amazon products. Um, what else is happening in streaming right now? Apple recently struck a 10 year, $250 million exclusivity deal for the MLS. Google estimates the number of digital viewers of live sports in the United States is about 57 and a half million this year. It's expected to exceed 90 million in 2025. Broadcasters have poached a sport whose recent popularity was sparked to the internet. So the F1 had a big show on Netflix to the point that someone I really, really respect, one of those people from college that you see on Facebook. She's like, me and my whole family watch this. And she's like, I, but when we, she couched like this, I'm going to start this post by saying that I didn't think I would like this and I really wildly like it. So I don't get the F1 because I haven't sit down, sat down and watched the Netflix docuseries Drive to Survive. It was a genius production, though, sponsored by F1's parent company, Liberty Media. Interesting. There's an investment angle right there, Liberty Media. But keep in mind, Liberty Media has a lot. They reported that F1 generated $360 million in revenue during the first quarter. A 100% increase from the same period in 2021, with F1 gaining traction in American households. But it has a strong European fan base. So. Analysts are saying ESPN got a big win by getting F1. Again, I wish I knew more. It's like uh, all the new games, like you, you're trying to catch up with them and you're like, is MLS, what sort of franchise value are we going to look there at? And then <clears throat> you see the investments that people like LeBron James are putting on. And you're like, okay, what's going on with this? But F1 has shown its place this year really quite well in the United States. Um, the May telecast of the inaugural Miami Grand Prix had an average 2.6 million. That's the largest U.S. audience on record for a live F1 race. Now, are they going to get up to the 100 million eyeballs that we get for the Super Bowl? Hmm. It'll take a while, right? Um, but what was interesting on this story was that over the weekend, I was seeing tweets about the founder of Red Bull, which... If you know anything about drinks, kind of came out of nowhere and surprised Coca-Cola and Pepsi. The king of sodas. Founder of Red Bull, Dietrich Matras, died at the age of 78. The extreme sports enthusiast was instrumental in developing the brand's racing team, which has won four constructors' championships. So ESPN is speeding in on a solid deal with Formula One when the numbers are small. Pepsi and Coca-Cola have taken a keen interest in a, a, another teeny tiny guy out there, not Red Bull, but in this case, a drink called Celsius, which is probably the next soda company to be acquired after a Red Bull many, many, many years ago. You can find me online at Red Rob Black Show, Twitter Rob Black Show, YouTube Rob Black Show. I'm Rob Black. Questions about Social Security? Check out the Social Security Retirement Guide at robblack.com. That's robblack.com, powered by EP Wealth. It's a staggering amount of money when you think about how much Evan Spiegel has lost in one calendar year. And yet he's going to be okay. CEO Evan Spiegel's net worth plunged 83% from 14 billion to 2.3 billion. If you do any background on Evan Spiegel, he was a cocky and arrogant kid. So you can't tell me raising a cocky and arrogant kid's a bad thing. Or maybe you can. I don't know. I guess you can. Beyond Meat's rolling out its meat substitute into Kroger, Walmart, and other grocery stores. The cost is just prohibitive. And it's it's interesting because, like, you know the Xbox and Sony? When they make the PlayStation and the new Xbox, they're money losers for the first two or three years. It's called a loss leader. They need to sell a lot of games because that's where the Microsoft's neck and Sony's make money is licensing the technology. So Beyond Meat 
But if they want to get it into more product, they're going to have to lower the price and eat some losses. Maybe. Do you see it as a loss leader? Or you as a consumer, do you go, I only have so many dollars? Inflation adjusted college costs declined for the second straight year. Inside this data is some fascinating stuff. Okay, so let's get the, this out of the way. <sighs> Inflation adjusted college costs declining? Okay, that's kind of interesting. You got me there. It's the problem is that the funding for state colleges are going down too as states struggle with the economies. You're seeing the academic school year for students at four year private institutions sitting around $39,400. Um, <clears throat> for the academic years, for average tuition and fees, rose about 1.6%. For it in state, you're looking at about ten thousand nine hundred forty dollars. So let's say you finish in four years, you're looking at forty two thousand dollars roughly. And with private schools, you're looking at one hundred and twenty thousand dollars. The net price or tuition and fees minus grants, scholarships, and education tax benefits also lower when adjusted for inflation. This is obviously welcome news. But listen to the bigger trend here. In the last 10 years, we've seen education borrowing decline. So we've seen what would be referred to as peak debt. In the last year, students and parents took out $94.7 billion in education debt. That's down from $141 billion of debt a decade ago. So the business of being a college is seeing less and less free money, and you're seeing more colleges shut down. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? So let's go back to the whole, is this a good headline or bad headline? Inflation-adjusted college costs declined for a second straight year. It probably means less choice because they are businesses. And I got a very impassioned email from a listener who she's a chef and what she was, what I'm trying to make this point on debt being down on a 10 year trend is a bad thing. I believe for the United States economy in the long term. as a chef, she's talking about more and more farms and how she has her own backyard. It takes about 10 people to work her backyard because she's got so much produce growing on it. And she just took a cross country trip across the United States as you do cross country trips. And she sent me just a very lovely email where she said, you know, Rob, one big problem that we're going to see here, more and more farms are selling. And when they sell their farm, they're selling it to condo developers. So we're losing more and more farming land. If you've heard about rich people like Bill Gates investing in farmland, Google investments in farmland because you can do it and see if it's up for you and or not. It's all about Verizon for taking action on any stocks ever mentioned on the show. But I thought that was an interesting commentary by her. She said she's upset that like the University of Minnesota's cafeteria system for students, they're understaffed because they don't have enough people to prepare the food. And then she went on to say something pretty funny about how she thinks people are a little too entitled and won't prepare their own food. As a chef, she has a different perspective on things. It's like in the United States, as a chef, you have to be offended that an organic chicken is crazy expensive, but French fries from McDonald's are crazy cheap. For what, how much energy do you have to consume on both? And if you go to Tahiti, if you go to Bermuda, you'll see that that chicken is super cheap and the French fries are super expensive. And yet they both use the same product. But the way we value it in the United States, it's price per calorie. So I just wanted to say, uh, I'm going to get back to her email at a certain point in time, but man, I, my audience is smart. I do appreciate that. Some other things to think about. The average US consumer now spends 52% of their take home on mortgage payments. That's too much. And when the economy goes bad, you're going to see foreclosures. A lot of foreclosures. If we lose a lot of jobs. Um, 
Inflation is hitting savings and retirement contributions. Some data is starting to come out about this. Morgan Stanley study looked and saw 62% of employees are saving less. This is when you want to be saving more, but you weren't ready for it. This is, what, this is exactly what that's telling me. 31% have cut down on 401k contributions. 26% have pulled back on debt repayments. One minute. Pulling back on debt repayments is going to kill your credit score. Kill your credit score. It's going to cost you more money to borrow. The cost of borrowing is, oddly enough, super inflating right now as well. So talking about some double whammies and triple whammies coming up. Generation Z and millennials got the short end of the stick tightening in their savings belts more than others. And again, the youngest people should be saving the most or be most committed or have most of an emergency plan allocated so they can take advantage of the multiple downturns in their lifetime. I wish I could go back and tell myself that. That's why I do the show and I tell you that now. You can't be cutting back now. You're going to fall further behind. I'm Rob Black. Find me online at Rob Black Show, Twitter Rob Black Show, YouTube Rob Black Show.